Um, so this is uh, our second panel, and I hope it's as vibrant as the last one was. I really appreciated some of those comments. And this one is actually about a, a very tough issue, how you get done, tough choices, which places and why. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Brenda Clement, who's then going to take over and introduce everyone else. Um, uh, Brenda is the executive director of CHAPA. She became executive director in April 2012 and manages all aspects of the agency's work. She's a nationally recognized expert in, uh, in affordable housing and who previously served as executive director of the Housing Action Coalition of Rhode Island, which was a statewide advocacy organization, as well as the executive director of the Housing Network, the Rhode Island Trade Association for CDC. She's also a, a founding member of the New England Housing Network, the, news, uh, the regional organization initiated by Chapra in 1995, and is on the board of the National Low-Income Housing Coalition. I'm sure you can see that she has great expertise to run this panel. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for being here and for sticking with us um, for uh, what I hope will be and know will be an interesting discussion uh, based on the knowledge and expertise of our panelists. Um, of course, this is really easy, um, how to get it done. <laughs> you know, uh, The first panel, I think, uh, queued up a lot of the uh, challenges and the barriers and, uh, and the concerns that we see, and so we want to spend a little bit more time diving in a little deeper into some of those issues um, and talking about what what's working, what isn't, and what else do we need to be doing to try to address these uh, pretty um, pretty challenging issues that, um, in many of these communities. We're going to start off uh, first, and I think I'll uh, follow the format that my colleague Joe uh, did, where I'll introduce the panelists as we as we move forward. But we're going to start off too with a presentation from Claire. Uh, Ricker, who's the senior planner at the city of Holyoke, Massachusetts, and Claire has been uh, works on a variety of projects as a senior planner, uh, ranging from uh, trying to implement the urban renewal plan, uh, including transit-oriented development, infrastructure projects, and cleanups of brownfields, as long as wide range wide range planning and community visioning processes. Uh, Claire has a lot of knowledge, I think, from uh, from projects that she worked on during her. Um, her educational background, uh, particularly focusing on uh, potential development strategies in one of the gateway cities called uh, in Fitchburg. Uh, she has a BA in history from Mount Holyoke College and a certification certif a certificate in construction management from the Wentworth Institute of Technology. And so, Claire, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. All right, so I'm Claire Ricker, uh, and I was uh, in school here last year. Um, and my, I took the Gateway Cities uh, project course in my final semester and I focused on the city of Fitchburg. While I was here, I also did a J-term externship with the city of Lowell, uh, where I worked on a, I was on a working committee um, exploring concepts of innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, how they can be implemented uh, spatially and what the needs and requirements might be to attract that kind of um, development. Um, I also lived in Salem in the early 2000s when then candidate Driscoll knocked on my door uh, and asked uh, what I thought that we needed in Salem. Um, and I still am waiting for my parking permit mayor. Um, <laughs> I love gateway cities. Uh, they are very evocative. The human scale, um, the legacy built environment is something very, very compelling. Um, and um, I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you. So, Holyoke. A uh, very quick introduction. Um, we're a small city in the western part of the state. We're north of Springfield, Mass, along the Connecticut River. Um, and as uh, I did in my Fitchburg project, uh, we are always quick to point out our uh, location rel relative to the larger urban economic um, drivers. Uh, the greater Boston orbit we try to claim as well as um, New York City. Uh, not just us, but some of our property owners as well. Uh, this is my absolute favorite uh, thing <laughs> that has ever been said about Holyoke. I wish we could put it on the highway uh, near the exit. Uh, it would be fantastic. Uh, all right. Um, so for a little more, um, oh, let me go back one, a little more precise uh, geographic orientation, uh, we also have a waterfront. We are bordered entirely to the west by the Connecticut River. Holyoke was the first planned industrial city in the country, taking advantage of a 30-foot um, uh, geographic uh, amenity, basically, where the, where the river just drops. Um, they dammed it um, and used the energy to power uh, mills and the downtown in, in general. Um, we ended up with a gridded street pattern um, and these canals also still. 
I don't know why this keeps going like that. Um, Lake was known as the um, paper city. And again, this is very typical of other gateway cities, the physical features, river, mills, and this industrial infrastructure. Um, so what remains um, are these huge mill buildings in various states, both of function um, and also disre disrepair. Uh, millions of vacant square feet um, in our downtown area. Um, also, just legacy architecture of this Victorian and, and Edwardian industrial city. Uh, Charles Atwood designed Holyoke City Hall. H.H. H. Richardson uh, designed our uh, train station. Um, again, this is something kind of typical of, of gateway cities. Um, that I have observed, this is a strength. Uh, much of the vintage part of Holyoke uh, was spared from like 1960s style urban renewal, for better or for worse. We didn't see much mass raising, and we didn't end up with a highway cutting through town or cutting the town off from the river. That said, much of downtown Holyoke um, is especially vacant, blighted, uh, or burned. In fact, that is the Richardson train station in the upper left. But we're working on it. Um, we have a willingness to be creative, a willingness to use some, if not all, of the tools in the toolbox, a willingness to capitalize on our assets. Um, in 2012, the uh, city of Holyoke passed a modern urban renewal plan, um, which encompasses the four cens lower census tracts downtown. It's the largest urban renewal area in the Commonwealth. Uh, we've established an arts and innovation overlay district, um, which would allow for a five to 20 year uh, TIF financing. It allows a multifamily and an industrial zone, work live on the second floor above. This is connected to um, a, a transformative redevelopment project, $95 million uh, Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center down, uh, downtown in the canal area. We market our cheap green energy. Electricity in Holyoke is about 90% carbon free because of the hydroelectric generation of the dam. Uh, and also we you know, uh, have upgraded uh, our public amenities. Uh, we've received a MassWorks grant, a $2.5 million uh, passenger rail station uh, will also be going in downtown in the next year. So this is not my image, but it does show massive um, investment and initiative in downtown, um, resulting in great projects um, and upgraded infrastructure. So this is, a, this is the, our canal walk we will be putting in phase two this summer. That's a $4 million infrastructure project uh, that will be going in on, the other, on, this, on our second level canal. Um, and this is, the, this is the result of the first level work. So, uh, we've been taken advantage of, of most, if not all, regulatory uh, initiatives. Um, Chapter 43D, we got a, a $100,000. Chapter 40R, which is smart growth, gave us a grant of, of $350,000, green communities. Uh, we seek funding um, through that program for a variety of, of uh, efficiency uh, projects. In fact, I, I was, sadly had to miss the luncheon today because we had a grant due at 5 p.m. And I was there this morning, and there was this big problem, so we had to fix it. Anyway, the grant's going to go in. Um, and I'm glad to be here now. Um, and uh, as well as Gateway Parks grants, um, we had a, a, a wonderful uh, renovation of Veterans Park, um, which is across the street from a new multimodal uh, transportation um, center downtown. In general, we know where to get the money. However, uh, you know, challenges do remain. Um, this is a, a, a wonderful project, which is an adaptive reuse um, of the former Holyoke uh, Catholic High School uh, and convent. Um, they will be using um, tax credits and private financing. Um, this project was envisioned um, as a mixed income housing uh, project with some available market uh, rate units. However, as it's progressed, uh, the market rate units that have been planned have been um, mostly eliminated. Uh, we're stalled right now, waiting uh, for historic tax credits. Um, along with other gateway cities, we are eligible for the uh, HDIP program, but unlike some of them, we, we have not had a project yet that proposes um, taking advantage of that program. So, the challenges. Um, the greater, greater issues <laughs> obviously remain. Uh, there's a devalued property market um, with this rapidly deteriorating um, existing building stock. All, you know, some of the things that make Holyoke such a wonderful place to be are, um, are really falling down around us. 
Um, in, in a few years, adaptive reuse of some of these structures will not even be on the table. Um, the development expectations, developers tell us they can't make project work, projects work, housing projects especially for market rate, or we hear, um, yes, we can do it, yes, we can do it, and then they come back, you know, developers will come back to us and say, the, actually, the bank says that we cannot. Um, when projects do happen, especially housing um, projects, requirements uh, for how long the, the, the units are required to stay income restricted um, can be 99 years or longer. Uh, when you go to refinance these projects, they'll tend to tack on another 99 years. 21% um, of all housing in Holyoke is income restricted. 40% of all rental property in Holyoke is income restricted. That's the second highest um, percentage in the Commonwealth. Um, so I showed you the slide before with all the infrastructure projects downtown. We also have 100 new or renovated units of housing planned. 19 of those are expected um, to be market rate units. Will this spark more market rate housing? I hope so. Um, <laughs> th this is the other side of the, of the coin of, of gentrification. Um, much like Salem, we would welcome some. Um, what we end up with um, instead, sadly, are these areas of just breathtaking concentrated poverty, especially in the, in the center city urban renewal area uh, where, where uh, medium income is less than $16,000. So this concentrated poverty, both locally and the fact that poverty in general in the region tends to be concentrated in Holyoke and in Springfield, um, you know, leads us to what, what I think is a, is a, is a big issue um, for Holyoke especially, which is time. Um, and what we see are, or what we start to see in the community are some things happening, and it's great. Um, the parks are great, and the transformative development, and all of these things are wonderful. Um, but what we don't see is the, is the, it's hard to turn the ship. It's very hard to, um, you know, to affect change, uh, to policy change, um, things that would uh, ma make us a little more flexible the way that a lot of these, um, a lot of these policies and, and regulatory, um, you know, uh, things that are granted to, to gateway cities that we've been able to take advantage of. Um, so I guess without, uh, without further ado, that, that's Holio for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Gave us a lot of food for thought for our uh, discussion as we continue. I'm going to keep going down the line and turn it over next to Ben Foreman, who's the research director at Mass Inc. Um, he is uh, the lead researcher and program, uh, has co led the Mass Inc.'s uh, Gateway Cities program. Um, we, he's off, authored a number of uh, papers and publications on the issues and challenges of Gateway Cities for Mass Inc. as well, too. So, Ben, I'll turn it over to you to talk about Mass Inc.'s involvement in Gateway Cities um, and uh, your thoughts about how we uh, get it done. Uh, thank you very much, Brenda. It's really exciting to be on this panel to get to talk about what we do about it because um, I've been working on this for seven or eight years now. and really eager to see us roll up our sleeves and do this work at scale. And I, I, I'm, I think that we really are approaching that second phase where our communities have more of those opportunities. It, you know, just a side note for planners who are in the room, students. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a planner by training and I've been doing this policy work and it's tedious and uh, <laughs> you really have to be in it for the long haul. So. I envy people like Ann who actually get to build something. And <laughs> I don't want to deter you from doing it because we definitely need uh, people who are interested in the policy work and, and the urban planning work. But uh, you, you need to have some fortitude to, to stick with it. And I think sticking with it does pay off because um, you can m make an argument and hopefully it starts to spread. And I think the argument about doing something is it's the state's job to do it. Basically, the federal government uh, has to, you know, washed its hands of that. Uh, and I, I, I think and is not really providing communities the, re the resources to rebuild and reposition for a new economy. And in Massachusetts anyway, local communities don't have the control over taxation to finance redevelopment. So that leaves the state. And I think we're in a very fortunate place because Massachusetts is a very wealthy state and has the resources if it so chooses to rebuild our gateway cities. And what we've been talking about the last eight years is that our state policy is oriented away from gateway cities and toward Boston. And if you look at any area, I think you'll find that to be true. Whether it's housing policy, where we're very much focused on a strong market, 
We're an education pro policy where we rank 46th as a state in investment in public higher education. And when you think about that, that translates into an issue for Gateway Cities because it's Gateway Cities where those institutions are located and Gateway City families who disproportionately use those institutions. Whether you look at transportation investments, we heard a lot about regional economies and being able to get to jobs. We've built a very robust transportation system to serve other parts of the state and really uh, forsaken public transportation in, in other communities. So uh, I think it's a state agenda that we're trying to move forward. I think it's a, uh, an agenda that the state um, has the re resources and wherewithal to support. And so then the question is, what does it look like? And we very much urged um, leaders to think about what's transformative, what builds market in these places. And I think there's maybe three lenses to look at that through. One is kind of the downtowns, the walkable places where we see these rich assets. How do we realize those? And what are the investments we make as a state that are going to bring private investment back into those places that have, I think, by everybody's standards, real potential? And then I think the second question is, what do we do in residential neighborhoods uh, where there is really significant blight? And I, you know that's an issue that we can solve because, um, as Prabal showed, we haven't. You know the market's not strong, but there are people that are living in these places. You know the housing is more or less occupied. So why aren't those neighborhoods as strong as they can be? What can we do to strengthen all of our neighborhoods? There really are only a few dozen neighborhoods in the whole state that are really seriously uh, disinvested. That's a manageable problem that I think we can come to the table and figure out how to be transformative in that sense. And the last area, which I think is really important, is how do we be transformed from the perspective of industrial assets? I think we in overlooked industrial policy for a long time, and that has been to the detriment of our gateway cities to be regional economic engines. You know, I think one example that I've been thinking about recently is just look at the port of New Bedford. You know, that's an exceptional regional economic asset that the state has put you know virtually zero investment into for decades now, and I think. You know, if you compare that to the port of Boston, Massport, it's interesting that we name it Massachusetts Port, but billions of dollars of investment have gone into to the port of Boston to make sure that that creates jobs and, and blue collar jobs, especially for folks in this region. So those are kind of three lenses in, I, in my case for uh, really the state uh, rising to the challenge to work with our gateway city leaders. And I, um, I'll stop there, but I got lots of other things that I'm okay. waiting for those salvos. <laughs> uh, okay, let's let's finish uh, letting all of our panelists get in. I'll turn go back. Sorry, to, didn't mean to skip over Anne, but we'll go back to Anne, who is the executive director of the Neighborhood Developers in Chelsea. Anne has been working in Chelsea since 2004 uh, and working on the ground and in and in, uh, in a tough uh, environment, um, both uh, from the Gateway City's perspective, but also during a difficult time during the economic downturn as well, too. So, Anne, can you talk a little bit about some of your experience on the ground um, in the Gateway Cities and, and what's been working and how uh, how do you think uh, it gets done on the local level? Sure. Um, first, I just want to, you know, the comment on what I think are really the and then I'll go back to what we can actually do. But the, but the <laughs> fundamental issue is that we don't have the resources we need. And and the the despite what the state resources, there there's been um, a diminishing amount of federal and of of housing resources for many years now. It's been a, a pretty steady downward. Um, slope, and I don't think at the state level we can we can fill the gap for what we've lost in federal resources. And at the same time, you know, for over a hundred years we've have had growing income disparity. So when we look at these gateway communities, these are places where people have been displaced from wealthier communities, have been pushed out, and keep getting pushed further and further to the periphery. So. That, you know, that's really, what we're really looking at is, is just a bigger trend and, and what sorts of resources we have and bring to bear. And so this issue of, si of breaking down the silos is, is the critical issue. And, um, you know, I will really 
tip my hat to the feds who have been trying pretty hard to think about those issues. So I've spent the past um, week or so learning to have deeper conversation with our local police as we prepare for a burn a criminal justice innovations grant or something. Um, and, and it requires um, civic engagement and, and um, policing, working together. And, right, and that's, that's really, um, I think, the, the key. And it's, I, I've often said to Prabal, what, a, what an audacious challenge to put to the cities. And if I had gotten to ask a, ch a question before, I would have said, so how do we take that audacious challenge about building collective leadership, collaborative leadership, how do we take that to a regional level, to a state level? Um, because, uh, because what is working, and, and Chelsea's a pretty interesting laboratory to be working in. What's working is that we actually are having collaborative leadership. And um, so when Aaron went down his list of resources and, you know, he mentioned some of the resources we'd used and talked about the box district, but um, we had used every resource that, that he listed and then some at, at the community level. I've spent the last nine months meeting on a very, very, several times a week often with our city manager, with our superintendent of schools, with Molly Baldwin who heads ROCA, with the police chief, around how do we tackle our toughest community. And, and we really have come up with, it, so we have one neighborhood that's, and I only, I, I think a lot about policy issues, I've been deeply involved with policy, but it often feels like it's when you test it at the local level that you get some, it's a reality check. So here's our neighborhood. It's 20% of the land mass. Now, Chelsea is only two square miles, so <laughs> it's not even two square miles, so it's, it's pretty small. 20% of the land, 36% of the population, 51% of the school children, 65% of, of the crime, over a third of the people live below the poverty level, Virtually everyone is below 80% very median. So we say, how do we, how do we move the people and the place? And, and that, was our, that was our question. How do, you, how do you move people and place out of poverty, but without a lot of, and it's a highly transient neighborhood, and we know that means School disruption, so poor school performance, which brings down the, the welfare of the city as a whole. We know that, that it increases chance of poverty, crime, and grime. And so we've said it, it actually isn't much as we all want the simple, simple answers, right? It's always what are the simple answers? It's, it, it, there actually aren't simple answers. The, or the simple answer is you have to have a collaborative leadership around uh, those simple goals. And then everybody has to bring their resources. So we said you have to change the place, the, the, the physical condition, you have to change the quality of life, and you have to give people resources to move out of poverty. And, and we have, and it all has to be measurable because what we really know is that, that actually there are big answers, you have to do these things, but when you get it to the ground level, how you actually implement those things, are it, it's a much tougher challenge. So we're gonna do it in a really data-driven way that, and, and we understand we're prototyping. We're gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna design a response around evidence that tells us this is what moves it, but we're gonna design it, we're gonna test it, and then we're gonna redesign it because we know that taking care of crime and grime and bringing amenities into a neighborhood, of moving people out of poverty um, and, and changing market dynamics that have really 
incentivize speculative investment without reinvestment in the in the real estate that's a tough challenge so that's what we're working on in chelsea well, i'm glad you're there <laughs> facing those tough challenges and uh, let's move to our last panelist uh, my uh, good friend and colleague barbara fields who's the regional hud director um, and has is one of 10 throughout the country uh, that works with HUD and trying to coordinate all of the different programs and resources, not only at HUD, but across uh, other federal agencies as well. Barbara is uh, a practitioner though, and for many years ran the local LISC office in Rhode Island and so worked regularly in neighborhoods and communities throughout Rhode Island um, on, on many, tackling many of these same issues that Ann and Claire outlined uh, before as well too. So Barbara, I'll turn it over to you for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I'm also delighted to be here. Unlike Joe Kreisberg who wanted to shrink his description, I read mine. I think mine got truncated because I got my urban planning degree down the street. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> At that other university. <laughs> so um, <laughs> on that note also I want to thank uh, the Joint Center for bringing me here and I, I'm going to talk with two hats. One is obviously my tenure at HUD and the federal partnerships we're building, but for 20 years on the ground in um, another state, Providence, Rhode Island. I think Providence could be a gateway city in some ways, um, as could some of the other cities that I had a chance to visit. So as soon as I pull the knife out on this side from um, Ben and Ann talking about this, the federal government backing away, <laughs> um, I then have to, I would put it back in from my other hat at LISC, understanding that that is absolutely true in some ways. And so looking where the Fed is doing innovation and things differently, hopefully, is where we can go with this discussion. I know from my years on the ground that what is needed is, is reiterating what others have said here, but it starts with leadership. And certainly leadership among elected officials and here in the state of Massachusetts, you do have a state that is a partner. You have mayors like Kim Driscoll who is a partner. That really matters. You have to have nonprofit leadership, business leadership. They all have to be present in a community at that grassroots level to really engage on this. And um, then you need the resources as it's talked about. And some of the work that we're doing at the Fed is talking about what are the resources we're already delivering to communities that perhaps they're not fully taking advantage of and that could be used at the local level with state resources, with um, foundation and philanthropic leadership resources and leverage to do more. But what has to happen among the leadership coming together and the community engagement that I was most proud of the work that I did before coming to HUD is something called organizing, which thankfully we have a president who was an organizer, so we could talk, start to talk about what that means. And really, it was bringing people around the table and not just the usual suspects to really engage in a long-term conversation. And like Ann was talking about dealing with the police, you have a starting point in that relationship, but you have to build trust over time. So bringing them together, um, you need someone at the community level, whether we call it the quarterback, the lead agency, whether it's a CDC or another nonprofit in the community, someone has to play that role. It has to do it over many years so that we continue to bring people to the table when it's appropriate to bring them to the table. But um, I think that is, is really important because the community needs to set its priorities. And I think we heard a lot of that today is something that I would really talk about. Not a laundry list because every community could talk about their laundry list, but how are you going to prioritize so that those who are investing in your community can understand what it is you want to get done and be held accountable. The final thing is, is time. And I think it's been said here before that the gateway cities did not experience decline over the last three years or the last five years or the last decade, but it has been several decades. And so hopefully the investors in these types of program can stay the course and we need to make it an iterative process over time. There has to be data driven, as Ann talked about, to see what's happening, to make mid-course corrections again and again, not just, well, it wouldn't be called mid-course, but along the way. I think that's really important. I do want to say one of the things where leadership matters, the gentleman who talked about could the police department be held accountable for graduation rates, that is something very much out of the box. It would be interesting to talk about, but I know in my town, in Providence, when we had a police chief who made community policing a priority, the best way to get a promotion became working at District 5 in the, in the neighborhood of Onlyville. 
the current police chief was the district captain when community policing was instituted. And when he got promoted, I thought, oh gosh, we'll never see another pol a lieutenant in that neighborhood. But because the chief of police was committed to this over and over again, we're now on the third lieutenant in that neighborhood. And people, all the, all the young incoming police officers want to be involved in community policing because now they see it after the number of years as the way to get promoted, to do further in their own career because things are happening there. Crime has been driven down in that neighborhood because of the work of the Onlyville Housing Corporation. And they served as that role, as that intermediary in that neighborhood, bringing people together. And I could talk more later if people are interested in the work that went on in Onlyville but a case study was done by the Department of Justice. It was called Building Your Way Out of Crime and showing how crime statistics can go, get taken down. The police would say, we can bust up a drug ring, but then we have an empty house. So we had to, they had to learn to work with the CDC, and so I'm hopeful for you and, and, and Chelsea because the CDC knew what to do with the house. They knew where to get the resources and turn that abandoned property into affordable housing for families in the community. And then working together with those who were building a park in the neighborhood, we saw in this one neighborhood, and I think the mayor would appreciate this, it was 4% of the land mass in the city. It was taking 15% of the police and fire resources. And today, eight years later, it's taking 4% of the resources in 4% of the area of the community. And that means a lot to a mayor who has to distribute resources throughout her community. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. So one of the things that we talked about and that both uh, Claire and Ann um, showed, I think, in their comments is that their gateway cities are very different cities as well, too, even though we all call them the name. There are different challenges and different issues. So can you either or both of you talk a little bit about um, uh, what's, uh, you know, what are the different strategies or what are the different ways or different tools that you think you need to use to address? Is it, is it really just about, as Barbara said, just kind of prioritizing, picking your top mm -hmm. couple and focusing on that? I mean, I know for vacancies, for instance, we talked about this on the call that, you know, for Ann, uh, being closer to the Boston hub, that is not a big issue and that the concern of, of gentrification and other things are a much bigger issue and concern in your neighborhood than they are in Holyoke where vacancy rates are much higher. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, how do you pick and select the different strategy that you need to address the local issues? Um, so we're intentionally trying to build a mixed income community because we know it's much more healthy. But in fa indeed, there are no vacancies, Vir virtually none, virtually none. We have, in, in my real estate portfolio, we have a less than 2% vacancy, and that's really just a turnover um, issue. A throughout the city, there, there, are, there aren't vacant and abandoned housing. And if there is, there are people who are living there, <coughs> Ill uh, just squatting there. Um, so, but, so Chelsea is really on the cusp of, of turning the corner. And um, it, re but, but we know, as is, as is Revere, where I also um, am doing a lot of work, those are, that's a fragile transition. It, and it's actually not a foregone conclusion, right? It, it, it might happen. There's some great, there's great groundwork that's been built. Um, but it's, but you still cannot do market rate housing in um, the neighborhood that we're trying to get some mixed income housing going. You still can't do it without some form of, of really patient equity or some fo and some form of subsidy. So um, we've successfully built a mixed income neighborhood, the Box District in what was a formerly industrial area. But the market rate housing, every single piece of it required some public investment. And so, it, and the most recent public investment was the, um, a, uh, was sort of a precursor to a fund that MHIC is putting together the Healthy Neighborhoods Equity Fund, um, which is really one of the si types of tools that we could use, that it offers an opportunity to stimulate growth, to take a level of risk that the private market doesn't, isn't going to take, um, 
and with with an opportunity for a return that can then, of course, reseed that sort of investment. Um, so, so I think that um, one of the real critical issues are are having tools that allow you to build that sort of of market rate housing, market rate workforce housing that that would make it a healthier neighborhood. But at the same time, we really have to be replacing the, the poor housing stock in the neighborhood with good, high quality, deed restricted housing that forever will protect this incredible resource of a gateway for immigrants. Um, and, and so that's where I come back to. Um, if there, there indeed are lots of people there, um, so it's not a level, it's not an issue of traditional disinvestment. It is a, a level of poor investment that's resulting in a really poor housing stock. And we can replace that with, with the right sort of financial tools that allow us to develop deed restricted affordable housing and some, um, and then also incentivize some market rate um, workforce housing. I think I can speak to the, the idea in Holyoke we are so overwhelmed with vacancy that so often our choice is between something or blight. And I, I have to hand it to the community, um, very uh, educated, uh, certainly about some you know planning issues. Um, you know, we, we don't jump at every project. Um, the, the certainly, um, you know, the th we're very engaged in thoughtful development um, and planning uh, for growth. Um, and that includes um, putting, you know, smart growth principles and parking requirements, all these things that um, kind of go along um, with, with residential uh, development and trying to think very, very holistically about um, not just um, having something there, but having really the, the right thing there. Um, you know, I'd say you know, that's pretty much how we're, how so, we're working. So Ben, just right. to drag you in on the conversation here, I mean, yeah. we put, get a lot of pushback um, as in the affordable housing world from uh, gateway cities who say no more yeah. affordable housing, but how do you produce mixed income housing and, and yeah. weaker markets like Holyoke, but even transitional markets like? This is a gr great question. Let me just start by saying I want to qualify my opening statements <laughs> in, in the sense that um, the, the Patrick administration has been incredibly creative in finding ways to put money in to gateway cities uh -huh. and has done a lot in the midst of a fiscal crisis, really. Yeah. And, you know, one a good example, I talked about underinvestment in the port of New Bedford. They came up with $100 million to build a wind, uh, offshore wind deployment facility there. So. Uh, I guess where there's a will, there's a way. But the bigger issue that we're getting to here, and I think it's really important for us to think about, is that our affordable housing resources are anemic, mm -hmm. and our weak market housing resources are non-existent. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the state budget, we're maybe spending 0.7% on housing. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, every year we spend more and more on housing, uh, on health care. Nobody's getting any healthier in large part because the housing market is taking such a toll on people. I think a real physical toll on people, especially in the greater Boston region. And so there should be outrage here. And I don't think we should retreat and say there's no more money. I think that we gotta say community development as a field has accomplished a lot. We know more now than we ever have. And that investment in our gateway cities, whether it's the strong market ones where we need to protect affordability and make sure that there's a place particularly within Greater Boston for people to live in a healthy way. But I think also uh, on the other side of the coin, in our strong market environments that aren't far away, or our weak, sorry, our weak market, it's Friday afternoon, <laughs> our weak market environments that often aren't far away, a city like Brockton, you know, where if we can transform that weak market, we can make it a reservoir of housing opportunity that really expands the regional housing market in a significant way. And I think that's critical because suburbs aren't going to build that housing. Our gateway cities want to. If we can make the market work in Brockton and Lynn, in a lot of places we could build more densely, we can create more units, address the lack of supply, and, and I think produce real long-term benefit for taxpayers. But it's only going to happen if we say enough enough with healthcare spending, 
or other things that really don't provide the time kind of return that we get on housing investment and really get new people to the table, not just our traditional housing advocates, but other people that recognize the challenge and help them become strong advocates for that state investment. Well, I think along those lines, uh, there is a lot of discussion, certainly within the housing community, around how to better link up housing and health care and how to try to figure out how to quantify the benefits of good housing, but not only just housing, but crime prevention and safe neighborhoods and communities and walkable communities and so forth, and how you better connect those up and show that there is a value in creating in the housing and community development work that they we do and making sure that we try to direct the resources. But I mean, we're all still struggling with how to quantify that and how to show that in community benefit agreements and other things. So I don't know if anybody on the panelists, if Barbara, if I you mean, want to one of the on things that. I think that each of the gateway cities needs to drill down into their community and decide what's best for them. But one of the things that HUD has done is our sustainable communities grants, which are mostly right now wrapping up, was an inter federal interagency partnership between HUD, EPA, and DOT, and in some places USDA. And these sustainable communities grants, we did 148 of them around the country, 25 of them here in New England. They were urban, uh, they were rural, they were suburban. And basically, they all had the same message. Most places are looking for some type of economic resilience, to have a diversified economy, to attract outside investment, to have inclusiveness. And so, for example, Holyoke is part of the Knowledge Corridor. So there were attempts to look at a regional housing market. Now, one of the things in New England, we're so proud of our local control, we don't have county government. So it makes a whole different discussion that we have than when I'm at a meeting with the other nine regional administrators and they start talking about King County in Washington, I'm like at a loss because we don't do decision making that way. So I think our grants actually did more in New England, perhaps, because I hear from the mayor of Bridgeport, for the first time ever, I sat down with the mayor of Stamford, Norwalk, and New Haven, and we talked about our co common issues. How could we work together as opposed to competing with each other for limited federal resources or from Holyoke to Hartford and there of course we had to do two different housing plans on each side because the states do have different programs and different investments but I think it is one step to think about regionally what do you want to be doing and then of course each community each city and then going down to the neighborhood level have to look at it but I do think um, it is a step in the right direction that office is now being called the office of economic resilience and uh, the new person running that is a smart growth advocate known to a lot of people. I just had her in Somerville and then the Fairmount line in Boston looking at some of the incredible work going on here. And I do think, thinking long term, what are the resources we do have? She was talking about a Department of Labor program that could link up to jobs. So I think we at HUD are trying to link into the other um, federal agencies, find out what resources are there, and try and help you think about it. When I come to meet with the mayor, I don't just want to meet with the CD person, who's the planning person, who's your economic development, and what can HUD do as a quarterback within government versus the quarterback at the neighborhood level to try and reach out to other federal agencies and get them um, to help you find out what resources they have, what do we have that we're not using, and to quote Winston Churchill, now that we've run out of money, we need to think. So I've taken that directive in our sustainable communities program to say, what's already out there? What can we do? What are in your now, your regional plans that we can figure out how to deliver from different pockets within federal government that you may or may not be aware of? So one of the groups that we haven't talked a, a lot about yet, are, and, uh, but I'm sure at least on the local level that you tried to work with them is business community and the, uh, the local business uh, owners, but also the, you know, the, the groups, the chambers of commerce, the, of the, all of the business uh, associations. So does anyone want to uh, comment at least about your experience on the local level, but how do we more engage them? But, and Ben, maybe you can then comment about how do we more engage them in the advocacy agendas? Why should they care? about gateway cities becoming healthier, more vibrant communities. Do you want to, I don't know, who wants to start? <laughs> I, I can speak to our Chamber of Commerce, um, who was a, a, an extremely active partner um, in the Working Cities Challenge Grant. Um, they uh, just absolutely um, instrumental and, and totally understood um, the idea that we needed to get behind um, some of these uh, less funded, less represented uh, entrepreneurs and business owners in town. Um, 
to, 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 su to support them. And, um, you know, that's really where um, our business uh, base is going to expand. Um, they, were, they were quite receptive and, 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 and really helpful. I don't know if you want to comment at all. Well, just, um, you know, actually outside the working cities, but, but really key to gateway neighborhoods um, has, is, our, is our local business district. Um, and, and they are um, really our central business district. Businesses tend to be small, pretty diverse. In both Chelsea and Revere, they're relatively um, healthy neighbor um, business districts, but, but they're as, as the, they're small local businesses. And one of the resource pieces that we continue to need are technical assistance and support for, for businesses. And, and the days of Main Street programs being well-funded and able mm -hmm. to help um, businesses grow and, and understand marketing and accounting and, and things like that. Um, it's just not there anymore. And, and um, so I would just say that one of the pieces for retaining gateway cities as um, just special places that, that don't fall prey to only big box, certainly we're happy that we have big box. We're quite happy that we have a Starbucks in Chelsea now. <laughs> that was one of our big victories. I, lo I gained a lot of staff time because staff didn't have to drive, you know, <laughs> to Everett to get their Starbucks. And, um, but, but we worry. We worry about the economic pressures as, as the communities really grow. We worry about whether our small business community is going to be able to, to keep pace. I, I think it's a really important question that we don't talk enough about. But this is actually something gateway cities share in common with Boston. In, in industrial change, consolidation, globalization, private equity has decimated the business communities in, in these regions. Mm -hmm. They don't have the corporate presence with, right, they're not local with, decision with, makers. Yeah, local in many of these with areas. the resources that they once had, and that is a, a major challenge. Um, on the other hand, we're trying to get Gateway City Chambers to work together, and I know you know that we've been working very hard on this transformative development bill that I think would really be a game changer for Gateway Cities in a lot of ways. And um, to the extent that we've had success, and you see provisions from that bill and, and the governor's bill, and likely. Hopefully, in the speaker's jobs bill, you know, I think that's because the Gateway City business community are speaking in one and the same voice on that. I think another partner in this too um, that I've tried to again see a, a model from Rhode Island is working with trade unions that are hired by the contractors. And I think in Holyoke we have opportunity with the redevelopment of Lyman Terrace. Mm -hmm. How are we going to engage um, and get uh, community residents hired and? Therefore, there's one program I've looked at through Emerald Cities, which builds a responsible pipeline through an apprenticeship program with the triple bottom line of community <coughs> residents hired, contractors with apprenticeship program, and energy retrofitting and energy building, and so jobs for the future, and knowing that there are jobs at the end. And most of the community groups, like Ann's, are investing in building, and so there are uh, opportunities for those businesses to be engaged. That's a, a different set of the yeah, business community, yeah. but I think we're seeing more willingness to think about that um, and, and think about the, the residents themselves getting those jobs mm -hmm. and different pathways, so we can talk about that. So we've talked a little bit about um, the importance of, of government and uh, particularly local government and making these things work on the ground. Uh, what it, I mean, and we talked obviously without regional government and regional planning and other things, but what are the other strengths and weaknesses in our current political structure? What are things that if you had a, an easy button or a magic wand that you would try to change on your local level and you don't have to name names or anything, but um, what about the structure prevents us from making these things happen? Anyone? Well, I, I, you know, I, I wanted to say a few things about education. I think. The business question was actually a good lead into that, too, because I think the business leaders in these communities are very focused on improving the education systems in their communities. I think when you look at Gateway Cities, the most exceptional asset they have is their learning systems. 
All of them have higher ed virtually in the community, so they've got great higher ed partners. M many of them have very strong vocational schools to the extent that they still are job centers, and they very much still are. I mean, they're a quarter of the population. They're almost a quarter of the state jobs. So there are very significant job centers, so you can do work-based learning. When you talk about their diversity. What's the wage level in those jobs, though? Is that part of the problem? Well, when you, when you look at the Gateway Cities as a share of total state payroll, it's declined, certainly, but it's still about a fifth of payroll. So mm -hmm. they're not as high paying as the jobs overall, but they're s still s you know, significant. So um, I think they've got all these educational assets. And the, the, the issue is that, again, education policy has largely been made by groups in Boston, with a very Boston-centric view of the world. Gateway cities haven't been involved in ed reform dialogues, even though those laws have very been much, very much targeted those communities. And so then they got to implement them. They don't feel responsible for them necessarily. They gripe about it, and they're not accountable for change. And gateway cities can't come back without their schools. And, th and that's a really important thing to recognize. Major cities, Chicago, Washington, Boston, all those cities can go through industrial change and come back without fixing urban education. Gateway cities, they can't do that. They get, you know, they're primarily sort of regional residential cities. Their draw is regional. They're not going to get people from all over the world coming to them that want to live in dynamic urban environments. They Two-thirds of their tax base comes from residential property. In Boston, it's two-thirds commercial. So really, the, the fact that school quality is reflected in residential property values, they won't have fiscal capacity if their schools aren't demanded by somebody. So mm. I think, you know, trying to figure out what's the governance structure What's the policy framework, and how do you make schools successful? For so long, it's been K through 12 schools on their own, governed by a school committee that was nominally chaired by the mayor, but many mayors wanted no accountability responsibility for it. It was the superintendent's job. And now we're sort of moving into an era of cradle to career, really community-wide learning. That's a totally different construct. Mm -hmm. And gateway cities are smaller environments if they can you know, if, if Prabal and his team can make them more collaborative, they can really build dynamic learning systems that I think leverage their educational assets and have real value. And, you know, that's obviously very optimistic, but unless they can do that, it's really hard to see a strong path for their for the, for them moving so what, forward. So what on a you know, state, I mean, are obviously some of the educational reform pieces, I mean, do gateway cities need to be pushing for more kind of the local decision changes or, or what's the right push or what, what's the right policy uh, initiative to push forward on education? I, you know, I think it's a complicated discussion, but one way to look at it is our education policy has been focused on closing achievement gaps, which is the right focus, and we shouldn't shrink from that in any way. I mean, that's an in, in economic justice issue. But from an urban education issue, there's also the issue of is there economic diversity in those school districts? When we started ed reform in 93, they were less than half low-income students, and now they're like 70% low-income students, and it's going up and up and up. And so, so we know from ed reform that you can make high-poverty schools work. And you know, from an education perspective, that's a valiant thing. But from a community economic development perspective, that doesn't achieve anything for you. So we need education policies that actually support economic integration. And so I think thinking about what are the assets in Gateway City Schools that are attractive to middle-class families, but also close achievement gaps. There's a sweet spot there. There are things that do that. And we could really make it uh, a priority to invest in those things and to celebrate those things. And we aren't really doing that. We're labeling these schools failing districts. We're pointing out how bad their scores are and not really demonstrating, well, there's actually some strengths here. There's some schools that are doing exceptionally well. How do we make those schools drivers of neighborhood revitalization. There's a lot that we could be doing in that area that, that we aren't yet. But if gateway cities raise their voices up, maybe state policy will be um, more con productive in that, that area. Gateway city folks, do you guys agree with that assessment? Do you think education's the one of the primary drivers of change in your communities? Absolutely. I, 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 I think that it's, it's absolutely crucial. It's um, the, the, the Holyoke schools are, um, uh, they've certainly had their issues. Um, and it does make the city uh, less attractive um, to, uh, you know, um, 
people would like to come in and um, open businesses and, and, and do um, all kinds of wonderful things in the city. Um, it is, it's, um, it's an anchor, uh, I, I have to say, and there, are, there aren't any easy answers. Um, we have uh, an extremely active um, school board, school committee, um, and a new superintendent um, who, who want to do all kinds of wonderful, uh, innovative things. Um, we're hoping, you know, certainly that um, that the implementation of, of, of these initiatives are going to are going to help. Mm -hmm. um, I. I I do like the idea of uh, you know maybe maybe the police or, or even the, the school com the school uh, situation being held a little more accountable for what's going on. We have a very high dropout rate. We have a very very high teen pregnancy rate um, uh, right now. Um, absolutely, I think investment um, you know in, 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 in getting the schools together uh, is is uh, imperative. I think some of the challenge is capturing some of the young uh, talent and energy that's coming into the gateway cities. I mean now capital follows the people. I mean, Holyoke, the, I met lots of young artists who said, I relocated from Brooklyn, just like your, your uh, yeah. sign said. I, it's very real. Um, and I saw it on the ground and seen it. And as, as people come into your communities, um, newer immigrants, what kind of pressures can they bring to bear to say this is a place they want to be? Mm -hmm. um, how do you engage the businesses? I think the more voices we have in the discussion, Ben, probably would say it was better, right? Um, to have those voices before they move out of Holyoke or and go to the, the next suburb over where they think the schools are better. And unfortunately, it's it's a hard squeeze on parents with young kids because they're like not going to wait for their kid. Um, but I know in my neighborhood, there was huge pressure put at a, at a, we had a time and a moment. And right now, we're very scared of it slipping backwards because even when you get the change, how do we sustain the change in the schools? And as Michelle Obama said, we know what a good school looks like. There tends to be one in every district, and every, all the parents are trying to get their kid into that school. <laughs> so how do we replicate it, and then how do we sustain it when we do find it, I think is another challenge that we need to collectively work on together. Well, I think so one of the – I'm sorry, Anne, go ahead. I was just going to say, so what my superintendent would say is that the single – greatest impact you could have on school performance is reducing the transients of students. And um, she's done a, a lot of research on it. And so it's really not always just addressing school policy. It is addressing um, ability of people to afford housing, to move out of poverty, and, and to address the issues of crime in our communities. Mm -hmm. So it, it, once again, unfortunately, we can't, if we don't improve schools, people won't want to stay. But if people don't stay, we are not going to actually be making good impact on those schools. So it, that's, that's where having the sort of all voices at the table and really working together each in our areas may be the only real hope to move the dial in our I think it's a nexus of education, health, and housing. And we had um, Dr. Jeff Brennan speak at a HUD thing recently. He said the best prescription a doctor could write is housing. Mm -hmm. So some stable housing, some you know, access to good health care, or even being able to be outside public safety, working with the police so you could open the door, a kid could actually walk to school even if, if there was a safe ways to passage, and, 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 and making those linkages. Uh, but I do think it comes back again to silo busting and having the unusual suspect in the room pushing for the education would be helpful too, mm -hmm. and not just um, the parents and the teachers. And Ben, do you want to jump in? Well, yeah, just one sort of interesting thing that we've been thinking a lot about is to use an architecture term. When you look at the transect of gateway cities, how, how mm -hmm. the density changes as you move out from the center, it's a very sharp cliff, right? In, in most of these regions outside of Boston, you get a, an urban area, a true urban area, and then it's more rural sometimes than suburban. Mm -hmm. And you know that means a lot for regional cooperation, I think. You know, it makes it harder because the people who live there are very different than the people who live here. Um, and it also makes it hard to kind of bring those families back to the city. I think they're very much you know, sometimes anti-urban people. So when you look at the market of people who are going to move to our gateway cities, I think they are largely people who have lived in larger urban areas that either can't afford them anymore, and so they want something more affordable, um, but still has some flavor of an urban place, and our gateway cities could offer that. Or, you know, they, we send people from all these regions to major cities all around the country, and then they come back to their region, 
uh, when it, you know they want to lay down roots, they often come back to the Pioneer Valley or the South Shore. Or, you know, so there's a chance to say to those folks, you know, you lived in Chicago, you like urban places, you obviously have some tolerance of crime and other things. <laughs> Check out our gateway city. So. <laughs> We might not use that as the marketing slogan, but, but we've been well, I do think you're getting been, to think, yeah. are we tapping into more yeah. trends for the yeah. next generation and what will they want? We've been doing the surveying, and that's what we're seeing in the surveys. When you look, you you would need a very fine tooth comb to find somebody outside of a gateway city who'd be willing to move there under any circumstances. But when you ask young professionals in Boston and other major cities, would they move to a small urban environment? There's a lot of openness to it. So I think getting them there is, is something we can do, but it's only going to happen if we can get the, mm -hmm. the school quality uh, issue uh, addressed. I think we have time to open it up for questions. So oh, I see somebody lining up. Go right ahead and please introduce good yourself. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Palmer. I just would like to hear from everybody who wants to comment, and especially Ms. Houston. <clears throat> what do you think is the single biggest factor in the prohibitively high cost of building market affordable housing? wants to start? I mean, it's a great question. And, and um, certainly the biggest piece of our construction budget is, is hard costs. Um, um, I, I don't have a magic answer. I know that, you know, there are endless studies going on now. Uh, I'd say uh, there's there's two pieces. One is that particularly on the affordable side, we end up having to build at a relatively small scale, at, at a small scale that doesn't get to a level of efficiency. So I can drop, if, if when I've looked at um, more than 100 unit properties, really getting into the 200, 300 unit, the cost per unit drops by rather than the under 50 that we can do in an affordable deal in Massachusetts, the the cost drops by about 100,000 a unit. So um, I, I think some of it is the scale that we build at um, and the level of quality that, that we ask for in this state, which I think is probably a good thing. Anyone else want to comment on that before we move to the next question? If okay. not, you're up. Okay. Uh, Bill Carlson, uh, I've had a fortunate life, and in my present retired state, I do two things. I do small-scale real estate development, and I do pro bono tax returns for small businesses in Chelsea, Everett, Somerville. So I know a lot of your clientele. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to highlight uh, your comment, Ann that the best thing we can do for education is reduce transience. And I would say that in the section eight tenants I've had, uh, my experience is section eight works a lot better than the reserved affordable housing, much, much better. And this idea of transience applies to healthcare, education, and housing. And I would advise anybody who hasn't to do some tax returns for somebody who runs, let me describe a small business mm -hmm. in Chelsea, for example, a maid who cleans toilets in Brookline and Cambridge, uh, a immigrant who brings hand cr handicrafts from their home country in and sells them at street fairs. These are small businesses. Uh, a problem they have is that they pretty often uh, make between 50% and 200% of the federal property line. <coughs> and to tell you the truth, neither I nor they know where they're going to fall between 60 and 200% until I see how their sales work in cr December. Because if you're selling crafts, what matters is Christmas. Uh, anybody read the ACA? See, now I'm going to start to sound like a Republican. <laughs> I've actually never voted for a Republican in my life. <laughs> okay, so how many of you all have done a um, sensitivity analysis on your rules, regulations, programs to see how they affect somebody who doesn't have a clue 
within 100% what their income is going to be next year. Thank you. Hmm. And thank you for doing taxes. We just, this is your like relaxing week. I know we just finished <laughs> a thousand tax returns in my office and, and my person is really happy that she's reached this point. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think you raise another challenge for working cities, though, about the uh, the somewhat inflexibility of a number of the programs, uh, federal programs and others, in terms of who we can target and what income levels we can target. And unfortunately, none of us up here control that. Um, but it's an important issue. Not only do we need fed more federal resources, but we need flexible federal resources that we can shift and target to different needs and different populations. Yes. Hey, question. I'm probably mostly for Barbara Fields. Um, I'm a developer from Portland, Oregon, doing small clusters of homes. And there's this great product out there called Mutual Self-Help Housing um, through USDA, um, RD. And it's not available in cities. Um, I think it would work great there. Is there any chance of breaking down some borders to make that available within cities where people can build their homes in groups and get some awesome financing at the yes, end? Yes, we'll take USDA's money. No, I <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> have to mimic the no. program, I think. I, I do think that they have certain programs that work in, you know, we are working with the USDA, but their programs are limited. Um, I am familiar with that. Um, I have spent a lot of time actually out in Oregon, um, but I don't see that coming into. I, I wouldn't expect the boundaries to change. I just think maybe HUD can mimic it. That's what I would be thinking. I can raise the idea and the suggestion. I would also say that if you're building in Portland, there's incredible growth on all of your spines um, because people have understood the connection between transit and housing costs, mm -hmm. which take up on average 52 cents from every family. Um, and if we could reduce the transit costs, you know, you got to do one or the other. And you have gone up four stories among most of your spines, which doesn't often happen here in some of our communities and the density issue and your urban growth boundary. So we'd like to bring those two to the, <laughs> to the East Coast. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting suggestion. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions before I let the panelists have the last word? One more coming. OK. Hi. Uh, my name is Tom Kegelman, and uh, Ann and I go back <laughs> probably more years than we want to talk about. But, um, <laughs> She was one of the first people I met when I started doing uh, community development in Holyoke, and uh, she's been a great supporter ever since. And, and I think we share a lot of the same feelings about this work and our dedication to it. But uh, I gotta say, you know, just looking at the statistics and looking at the larger picture, you know, the recent book that was published about income inequality and uh, the stuff that's coming out of our Congress, um, you just got to wonder, are we just playing with the margins here, you know? Yeah. Is there really something so crushing about our institutions um, that it almost represents an attack on the poor? And they're just, uh, I just would like you to respond to that, Ann. I know you have well, probably I, uh, something. I, Tom, I, th I think <laughs> I think that's exactly right, and that's why that's why I started off by saying, you know, uh, I think the true t context is the resources that that we dedicate to poor people have been shrinking, and and the um, income inequality has been growing at, at extraordinary rates, and so uh, I think. It is fundamentally an issue about political will, and to the extent that um, the place that I feel some hope is that when you and I first met, there was enormous di division within our communities about talking about problems. And when I was working in Holyoke, um, the city did absolutely everything they could to run out anyone who was trying to develop affordable housing. Times have changed. And we're now at a point that across the sectors, at the community level, we're beginning to talk about what are the really, 
what are the critical issues? We're beginning to understand that our that immigrants coming into our cities play a really important role in the vitality of our of our economy as a whole. We're beginning to value each other and learn to talk across our different our different perspectives. So will that add up to beginning to change the political will? I, I'm not sure, but um, I, I think it takes somebody a lot wiser than I to have some sense about how, y you're right, that, that, is, that is the real fundamental issue in front of us. Ben, do you yeah, want anything? I like that question, because I was actually gonna make my last thoughts around that. In the last 40 years, Massachusetts has gone from the state with the most equal income distribution to one of the most unequal. And that trajectory corresponds with the increase in poverty in our gateway cities. And there's lots of research nationally that shows as you get more income inequality in a region, you get more economic segregation. And then one feeds on the other. If there's no economic opportunity in the place, you don't have economic mobility, you have more inequality. Mm. And that's where we're at. So the question is, as a state, can we do anything about it? We're spending about a billion dollars a year right now in our gateway cities. Less than 10% of that is on any form of revitalization. Um, so say $100 million a year across 26 gateway cities, less than building an elementary school in each of these cities a year. Obviously, we can do better than that. If we have resources to do better than that, I think we can find the most worthy projects and then have some transformation. Maybe not everywhere, but I think in some places it can be achieved. And so. Uh, I just urge everybody to support the transformative redevelopment legislation. Uh, I see M Mass Development is here, um, and they have really, I think, as as um, un un Under Secretary Gornstein mentioned, built capacity to do this development work. And I think if we give them the tools through this bill, we can m make some headway. All right, we have two minutes, so anyone want to jump in for a quick 30 seconds? I just want to echo what Ben's saying. I mean, he's got some great data, but I, I have to get up every morning and feel hopeful. I do think we saw the quote from um, Janet Yellen to hear the head of the Federal Reserve talking about what we're doing here with Gateway Cities. Kudos to Prabal and his colleagues. It isn't a panacea. It's part of the solution, and they're coming to the table and getting us to think. That's important. I think the collaboration in the federal government and breaking down silos, whether it's our Choice Neighborhoods Program, working with the police and education, whether it's our Sustainable Communities, Economic Resilience, working with EPA, these are agencies that never talk to each other. So we've got to be hopeful that the resources are there. But I'll end by saying when our Director of Office of Economic Resilience came and talked about we need to plan regionally because what you do in one community to protect yourself may d damage the next. Since 2000, she said, this, um, we've had $48 billion in disaster recovery money that we've put into communities. And she said, we need to take a look at that money as it comes in, because it's not if, but when the next disaster happens. How are we thinking differently in our communities? How are we rebuilding? How are we doing things differently? So the questions are being asked, but we don't do anything at HUD. We don't build housing. We don't manage it. We invest in you. So all of you in this room have to be part of that discussion. So I particularly urge those who are students and under 40, we need you to be thinking about this with us because we got this work will not be accomplished in the next five years. It's a long-term discussion, but I thank everyone who's trying to ask the questions and think differently. Thanks, and yep, uh, Claire, go right ahead. So I graduated from here last year uh, and I moved to Holyoke and there is nowhere that I would rather be and I would also echo that anybody uh, around 40 or under 40, um, please, please, you know, your energy and your effort is very much, very much welcome and appreciated in these cities. Thanks. And last word, we were wrapping up. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Yes. Obviously, more discussion to uh, needed, but thank you so much, all, for your perspectives. And I'll turn it back to you, Anne. Yes, well, thank you, Brenda and the, and the panelists. That was a really fascinating discussion um, and brought back some memories of when I uh, did work in Holyoke in the 90s as well. Now, I am the one thing between you and wine and cheese with the student uh, work, but I have been tasked um, to just bring together some of the key themes of today. And I think I have roughly about five of them. And first is the idea of gateway cities as a way of naming issues and framing solutions. Um, they're gateways to opportunity, to change, to development. It's a way of thinking differently about assets and challenges, and people talked about that a lot. One 
issue or one particular challenge in naming and framing, of course, is this issue of gentrification. Is it speculation, displacement, turnover, or upgrading, diverse, uh, st stabilization, and diversification? People can see um, the change in uh, mixed income housing in a variety of ways. And in fact, I think that probably works differently in different kinds of gateway cities. And that leads to the second point that comes out of today's session, which is their diversity. You know, uh, some are growing and some are not. Some are getting more jobs, many are not. There's a lot of migrants, but not every gateway city has a lot. Most, uh, there's a lot of young people, but not everyone is young in these gateway cities. And there are some uh, distinct patterns to do with the location, particularly the distance to Boston area job nodes. Holyoke has a quite different problems to Chelsea, for instance, in, um, for in everything from housing to jobs um, to sort of their uh, long-term trajectory. From particularly for a, a, a session that's been sponsored by the Joint Centre for Housing Studies, it's also really important to say that the issues of gateway cities go way beyond housing issues to this intersection, as we've talked about, between education, jobs, transportation, crime, cleanup, and also just a sort of a culture and a spirit of, you know, is there hopefulness in this, in this region? There are complex regional links. Are they bedroom communities for regional job centers or job centers in their own? And if so, what kind of jobs and who can provide them? Um, it's, a, it's a complicated regional landscape. And when they are successful, I think there are some dilemmas of success. First of all, what is success? Is it um, a better balance of housing? Is it jobs? Is it pulling people out of poverty? Is it, is it quality of life? And how in particular do you deal with this balance between lifting people up, lifting up existing residents versus attracting new residents? It's a complicated picture. Um, and for some cities, there's a wondering, people are wondering whether success will ever come or, and when I listened to um, particularly Claire say that she had tried every single program in the toolkit, um, it shows that things can take a long time to come. Um, which leads me to the sort of final um, theme which is about potential for change. And there's a lot of talk here about key actors. Some about state and federal and local resources, but particularly about this issue of collaborative leadership within, um, within gateway cities and within regions, whether that's by a backbone organization or some, some key folks. There's also this idea of um, potential for change coming through learning from each other, the kind of learning community of gateway cities. And so there is actually a lot you can do with these ideas of leadership and collaboration. But on the other hand, I heard a lot about sort of things that are harder to change, like location, the uh, sort of taking a long view and having money. And certainly you can change what the location means and reframe how you both see your location and through transit investments actually reclaim what, uh, reframe what that location really means. But those are very complex kind of things to do. So those are the five points I got from today on naming and framing the diversity of gateway cities, issues beyond housing, some dilemmas of success and how we recognize it. I think we might recognize it differently in different places and this potential for change. But what I mostly got out of gateway cities is how passionate, out of these discussions, how passionately people believe in the possibilities for some kind of better future. And I really thank the Joint Center for Housing Studies and the other people who uh, worked to, to make this. The Joint Housing Center, folks were just fantastic. They, they've got a, a fabulous staff uh, for bringing us all together today to talk about this important problem. And of course, my words are not the final words. There's wine and cheese sort of at the end of this main floor in what we call the portico rooms, but basically you go that way as far as you can and you'll find them. And you'll there be able to see some of the student work that, um, that some of the planning students have been doing in Gateway Cities. It's not at any, by any sense the end of what's been done at Harvard, but it's just a, a little sampling of, of what we've been trying to do. So thank you very much for lasting this long on a Friday afternoon. And I, I, thank you.